Welcome back, statisticians. This is Ms. Cowan, and we are heading into Chapter 2. Today in class, we looked at um, how to data when it's in its raw form, which in this case was in the form of your Chapter 1 test scores, how that's not very useful to us just with all those numbers there. But how we display it and how we organize it can make the data much more useful to us so that we can draw conclusions, find where there's peaks and valleys, see where the majority of the people lay as far as the data goes. So that's what this objective is for this lesson. It's to organize data using frequency distributions. And in this lesson, there's a lot of long vocabulary words, but don't get freaked out by them. All it is is it's a very simple concept, so tallies and how many numbers are in each class and so on. So let's get started. Now there's going to be a lot of vocabulary like I said, so you'll probably need to pause this video quite often. The reason that a researcher organizes the data in a meaningful way is so that the findings will have a greater impact and help get his point across to his audience. And as we saw, you know, bar graphs and different ways of visually presenting things does make a greater impact and people can see the pattern. What is the most convenient method of organizing a frequency distribution? And just by looking at the frequency distribution, you can find the peaks and the valleys of the data. So after organizing the data, a researcher can present the data to be understood by constructing statistical charts and graphs. The frequency distribution really helps you to create those graphs. And we're going to be talking about different types this, this chapter. We're going to be doing histograms, frequency polygons, OGIVs. Now, I don't really know how to pronounce that. I'm saying OGIVs. It could be OGIVs or something like that. But I no not know. I didn't know. I'm just going to say OGIVs. And I'm probably wrong. Pie graphs, Pareto charts, and time series charts. Now we're going to review, of course, pie charts eventually. If you know how many degrees in a circle, you got to have a protractor and that kind of thing. That'll be kind of fun. Raw data is just like those test scores that you had. Um, it's data that's collected in its original form. A frequency distribution is an organization of raw data, data in table form using classes and frequencies like we did today with your test scores. What is a class? It's a qualitative or quantitative category into which the raw data is placed. In our case today, it was the letter grade, A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. That was our class, those were our classes. What is the frequency? It's the number of values in a specific class of a frequency distribution. So how many people got A's, how many people got B's, and so on. That would be the frequency. What are the class limits? Smallest and largest data value that can be included in the class. So like the class limits go, went from 0 to 100 in our case. What are the three types of frequency distributions? Well, you could have categorical, you could have grouped, and ungrouped. What is a categorical, you ask? Well, it is when you have a nominal or ordinal data level. So nominal is like names, it's like gender, it's like political affiliation, and so on. Some examples would be political affiliation, religion, major of study. Oh, what's your major? That's the first opening line when you go to college when you want to meet a good-looking gal or guy. Hey, what's your major? Okay. 25, let's do an example of one of these frequency distribution. 25 army inductees were given a blood test to determine their blood type. Here's the data set. And you can see there's all the different blood types. And we're going to construct a frequency distribution. Hopefully on your note sheet you can kind of look and see what they are. And we kind of did this today. So you've got your class. The class is the blood types, A, B, O, and A, B. Tally is how many times they appear. So here's my data chart. Ooh, it just popped in there. Isn't that freaky nice? So I would say, okay, and this one is type A, so I put a tally mark, and I've got a B, a B, an A, B, and an O. So those would be the tallies for that first row. Then you would continue on. So O and O, I'd put two tally marks down here, and so on. And when you get done, you can take my word for it. Here's what you would have after you do all of the data. So I just wanted you to have an idea where that came from. And then you count them up. The tally here would be five. Then you have 7, you've got 9, and you've got 4. And the total here is 25. That should match the number of data sets that you have. To find the percent, you take the frequency and divide it by the total. 
So divide each frequency by the total to find the percent. If you leave it as a decimal without a percent beh sign behind it, it's called relative frequency. So 5 out of 25, well, that's the same as 20 out of 100. You've divided on your calculator to get 0.2, which is 20%. Since this is 25, remember if I multiply 25 by 4, that gives me 100. So I could actually just take 5 times 4, 7 times 4, and 9 times 4 to get the percent. So you got 28%, 36%, 16%. So then you got 100%. So there are your percentages from your frequency. Here's the steps that are written on your sheet. And we just did all of these on the chart. Tally the thing, we did that. Count the tallies, place the result in column C. Find the percentage values by using the formula F over N times 100%. F is the frequency of the class and N is the total number of values. In this, for example, in the class type, A blood, the percentage is 5 over 25 times 100% to get 20% but I think you guys pretty know, pretty much know percentages, I'm hoping. Percentages are not normally part of frequency distribution, but they can be added since they are used in certain types of graphs, such as a pie graph. So they say they don't usually use percentages. Find the totals for column C and D, and they should total out. For this type, for this sample, more people have type O blood type than any other type. So it helped us get organized and find out where that is. Now in real life, O is very rare blood type. But this isn't real life. This is out of a textbook. Okay, when should we use group frequency? When the range of data is large. What is the class width? The difference between the upper and lower class boundaries for a class in a frequency distribution. What are the class limits? The smallest and largest data value that can be included in the class. Those are the class limits. What is the lower class limit? The lower value of a class in a frequency distribution that has the same decimal place as the data value. And the upper class is the same thing, except it's the upper value of a class in a frequency distribution that has the same decimal place value as the data. Now, these were just vocabulary. We'll see how these play out in our charts in a minute. OK, what are class boundaries? The upper and lower values of a class for a group frequency distribution whose values have one additional decimal place more than the data and end in five. These are the boundaries that you found in chapter one. Remember when you went down a half step and up a half step? And when you're trying to find the class boundaries, class limits should have the same decimal place as the data. So the class limits are different than the class boundaries. The class boundaries always end in five. However, the class boundaries should have one additional value, place value, and end in five. That's what I just said. Okay, how do you find class boundaries if the values are whole numbers? Well, this is a math formula you can use, but I think intuitively you already know how to find boundaries. The lower boundary would be the lower class limit minus 0.5. Now we're talking whole numbers, so those are end like 15. So you'd go down one, 14.5, and then you'd add a 0.5 on the end of it, so like 15.5. Then to find the class boundaries if it's in tenths. So let's say we have 15.2 is our number. You go down by 0.05, so you subtract 0.05 from it, or you add 0.05, and so on and so on, which you had practice with last chapter. What are the two ways to calculate class width for a frequency distribution? You can take the upper or lower class limit minus the lower or upper class limit of the other class. So in one class, you subtract the lower, upper, and the other. And we'll do examples of these in class. Class upper boundary minus class lower boundary is the other way you, that you can find it. So the upper boundary minus the lower boundary gives you the width. What are the six rules a researcher should use when deciding how many classes to use and the width of each class? There should be 5 to 20 classes, and there should be enough classes to present a clear picture of the collected data. Now, on this thing, in our, our example today, we had the letter grades. There were five letter grades, so that fit with this perfect. But you can, as a researcher, decide how many classes you're going to have. It is preferable, but not absolutely necessary, that the class width be an odd number. This helps with the calculation of the midpoint because it'll have the same place value as the data. 
the classes must be mutually exclusive, no overlapping, so that data can't be placed into two different ones. Number four, classes must be continuous, so there can be no gaps in the data. And the only exception occurs when the class with a zero frequency is the first or last class. A class with zero frequency can be omitted if it occurs at either end of the distribution. Classes must be exhausted, means there should be enough classes to take all the data and to place all the data into a class. Classes should be equal in width, so you don't get skewed data. Otherwise, you're manipulating things to your own ends. What are the two ways to calculate the class midpoint? Now, this is the class midpoint. You take the lower boundary plus the upper boundary, divide by two, that's one way. Take the lower limit plus the upper limit, divide by two, that's the other way. You should get the same thing either way you do it. What is an open-ended distribution? Frequency distribution that has no specific beginning or ending value. It could go on forever either way. Okay, that's enough notes for day one. That takes you through page four. It didn't seem to take very long, did it? All right, well, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.